I've complained about marketing in comics and how terrible it's been and some of the biggest misfires, uh, the biggest than just a lack of attention, but maybe there's a reason why comic book marketing just by and large just gets ignored. And that's because there have been some epic failures in the past. We're going to talk about Dazzler. Yes, Dazzler, the comic, the movie, the pop sensation. Get ready. Everybody, this is Perch. Um, I'm reminded this topic. This is one of those opportunistic topics where I'm I'm on the road and I'm driving, and I pass a billboard, and there's this uh, Shunyun show that has come to the Seattle area, and it's it's kind of a Chinese acrobat dance show, and this billboard is up, and it says, you know, find out why this show can't play in China, and my immediate thought, which is in bad taste, is like, well, because you know the whole the, the country's quarantined. That's that's why <laughs> the people are going to get sick and die if they go see it in China. That's why it's here, um, spreading the disease to the U.S. So that is horribly offensive, and uh, I, <laughs> I do not mean that at all. But my point is, the people who made that billboard had clearly made it before coronavirus, and uh, clickbait kind of teases like, "Come see the show and find out why you can't watch it in China." It takes on a different tone when, you know, travel to China is restricted. So that's uh, that's probably why. But uh, comic books, uh, in my mind, have a, a bad rap with marketing, mainly because they don't do any coherent marketing on a regular basis. If you talk to any store retailer, they'll tell you that the marketing is just abysmal with comics. And and why is that? Well, I mean, the, the, the obvious reason and the, the truthful answer is that there's just not a lot of attention put toward marketing. There are people who hold that title, but not very many of them. And they're, they seem to almost have kind of a fun job like, hey, let's do some experimental uh, videos on YouTube and try and market it that way. They're, they don't have traditional like, hey, what's it going to take to get this property marketed out into, you know, into the markets? Because the marketing people do not have a lot of you know, channel ownership, they can't actually do much. So there's kind of this, this, you know, not love hate relationship, but just this, it's a very passive thing. And a lot of cases, the real marketing of a comic is passed along cheaply to the, you know, the creators themselves or to editors who are like, hey, go market this book. And, you know, good luck. Meanwhile, we're going to be making this this YouTube video about how you can cook pasta in the shape of Thanos's head. And, and that that will be delightful. But it wasn't always this way. Actually, uh, corporate synergy or, or marketing synergy with comics has a long history between the, the NFL Super Pro uh, uh, exercise that Marvel did where there was kind of a, a superhero that had a NFL franchise tie. Um, it was terrible. To USA or US1, this was a, a comic about a trucker who had a, a cool truck. Um, this was an attempt to tie into Tycho. Um, believe it or not, the, the backstory on this one, and this maybe wanders in a little bit to rumor territory, was that Marvel had some fear of um, losing the Transformers line, and, and the, the comic was doing well for them. There's good buzz around it. So they're trying to hedge their bets a little bit by kind of buddying up with Tycho to make uh, a comic based on the Tycho trucks, and that became US-1. Unfortunately, the Tycho trucks were trucks, so it didn't, it didn't turn into a robot. You know, that, that was a problem. And then um, the, uh, the, you know, DC with Atari Force. Um, there is another kind of example of uh, corporate synergy. But the one that I love the most is Dazzler. So Dazzler, uh, there was an original, I, I believe it was through Epic, but there was a, um, a graphic novel series that was done through, I, I could swear it was done through Epic, but this may be my memory being bad. But they would do graphic novels. Um, this was long ago in the 80s when there weren't really, there weren't graphic novels like we think of them today. It was kind of a prestige format comic would be how you should think of it. So this is an original piece of work and it was Dazzler and it was a, a Jim Shooter production, um, had all the, the right makings. But the idea was that they were going to make a comic book, they were going to have a musician, and they would have a movie kind of all together. It was, it was an attempt to to kind of create a something out of nothing, create a new sensation that was going to connect all these these pieces. So they were going to have an actual disco queen kind of rocker, and she would look like Allison Blair, 
and maybe she would have a name, Allison Blair, <laughs> and um, and she would go on little adventures, and then she had powers, and you know, she then the pyrotechnics on the show would mirror kind of what was done on the comics and in the movie, and you'd have this this wonderful kind of triple threat of you know, getting the kids, getting the you know, music, having a movie. So this was uh, back in the very like late seventies. This idea got cooked, and um, the first problem kind of that kicked out was that the 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 band or the you know the music company that was that was going to find the talent, produce the album, put all the stuff together, uh, tapped out very early. They they basically. Uh, decided that they weren't interested and that that deal fell apart, didn't want to be in business around this. Um, the licensing rights were not that lucrative compared to other things that were going on in music. Maybe uh, there's a lot of problems why comic books in the music industry were not going to mix. So uh, uh, somewhere it, it is rumored that the there are, there are songs out there. There are like recorded disco songs that somebody did or at least some early, early demo reels, if you will, or some some songs that were written that were Dazzler songs. And I'd love to get my hands on those to, uh, to, to learn what that was all about. So with the musician gone, the idea was like, well, you could still do a good deal with a movie. And now some people started to shop the idea of a cartoon and comics. So the movie kind of kicked around a little bit. And uh, there were big promises around licensing that were made to the newsstand and to other places around this is going to be a big deal. And, and keep in mind, this is a graphic novel they were selling for the comics. So they slowly the timetable shifted to where the graphic novel is going to come out. It was going to get people really excited. More licensing money was going to come in and that would allow the script and some of the early pilot work to be turned into an actual movie and cartoon and other things. Um, I have, I, by the way, I should caveat this point with a little asterisk. I've heard consistently that there was a cartoon in the works. And then a few years ago, somebody somewhere in a panel asked Jim Shooter about the cartoon. And he said there was never a cartoon in the mix. Who knows? Maybe there was, maybe there wasn't. Uh, I'm not sure. I think there was a cartoon in the mix because I've seen enough material to suggest either somebody went through a very elaborate <laughs> con of making a Dazzler cartoon promotional materials and pitch. Or, um, you know, it actually was made. I, I have no idea why anybody would actually go through the trouble of putting all this stuff together. Yes, I know it's the internet where people do stupid things all the time. But anyway, um, so the comic book gets pushed and a lot of the, the kind of the licensing, the reach out, the this is going to be huge sales approach works. And the comic winds up selling well over 400,000 copies, it, it, uh, it, uh, which in 81 is, is a good number. Um, again, this is for a graphic novel, not, you know, regular newsstand comics. This is for a more expensive, uh, I think, $10 book, as I recall. I mean, again, 1981, 10 bucks. I think this was what was being pushed. Or maybe, no, it couldn't have been that much. Um, it, was, it was higher at any rate. It was, a lot of the books, I'm now kind of doing the math book. A lot of the books, I think, were either $7.99 or, or $6. six hang on. All right, it was $6.95. There we go. Canadian, $7.95. $6.95. And that was the, the price of this book, which, again, in 1981 prices, that was high. I mean, shoot, that's a copy of, like, an average issue of the Avengers today. I'm just kidding. The Avengers is cheaper. But still, $6.95 is, is a decent amount of money to sell 400,000 copies. So this was considered a pretty big success. Unfortunately, um, it was not considered enough of a success, and there was clearly no plan behind the comic book to actually take it to a movie and to other things. So uh, the buzz got that first issue sold, but then really nothing else. And then the, the character kind of drifted into uh, Chris Claremont's hands, and, and you know she kind of wandered into X-Men turf. Um, X-Men was, was kind of, was, was experiencing a really good run of comics. It was the hot comic at the time, uh, seen as the, as the cool hot comic at the time. And so there was kind of that, you know, I think there was this idea that, you know, we'll do a guest appearance over the X-Men. We'll get a little bit of attention there and that will keep this idea alive and we'll get to that, that movie money, um, that was, that was going to happen. But unfortunately it never did. We never got the Dazzler cartoon, the Dazzler movie, although who knows with Disney plus, you know, it could come back. But this was the kind of thing that would go on. So a lot of co-marketing, co-licensing deals that were done in the, in the 80s that were super duds. In fact, most of them were clunky. Even the ones that were really successful, uh, you know, 
generally speaking, we think of as success. We're not, we're not. Um, there's a mask comic book. There's a lot of these other things that, that just did not translate ever into real sales. And so as the 90s went on and the newsstand falls apart, the direct market is there. I think with it fell a lot of the kind of the leverage that the comics companies were trying to create saying, you know, we have comics everywhere. They're omnipresent. You can look at, you know, hundreds of thousands of copies, just like any other periodical. You can, you can get them. Suddenly that, that kind of, uh, that, that, that leverage went away, that package deal that they could sell to make a co-marketing licensing deal went away. And so when it did, I think that the, the ideas also went away. Suddenly the comics are, are just not as, uh, they're just not going to work as well. And it's certainly for, for creating this kind of attention from outside parties to do marketing, which means the comics are going to have to spend their own dollars for marketing, unless it's tied to a movie, and then the movie is probably going to drive it more than the comics. So by nature of kind of never getting this plan off the ground, never making it work, and it was very much an 80s kind of people were trying to do things with properties and get them places, but the fact that it never went anywhere really... I think spelled the doom of a lot of these efforts. And that's, that's where uh, we find ourselves today, where I think the idea of, of just good marketing, you pay for yourself and you make things happen are kind of a you know distant thing of the past is, is how that feels. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the story of Dazzler, the movie that never happened, the, com- the comic that, that was its own. Um, and that's an example of, of at least one reason why perhaps marketing is just not where it needs to be today. But it's a funny story. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, today, I think a lot of comic fans, if they contemplate the idea of, you know, a comic company leading the way of making a comic, having an artist that was called Dazzler and a movie and, and bringing all those things together. I mean, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. And it does make you wonder how much of the kind of the thinking behind Dazzler and that kind of, I mean, Marvel was definitely enamored with this idea of rock music and having bands that were connected to comic characters and all the rest. I mean, Howard the Duck, the movie, um, I, I strongly believe, although I, I found no connection, that at least some of the ideas and some of that spirit, that love of, of being able to do something like that, uh, made its way into Howard the Duck because I mean Howard the Duck was way too into Howard becoming a rock star and, and Bev. And, I mean I know the comic book was you know, had that did that tie as well, but I mean the, the movie played weird. And so if you look at that movie and you think parts of this were going to be Dazzler because um, Dazzler I think the original movie script had her like she's going to fight a, an alien threat from outer space that that was dangerous and it's like. Yeah, that, that, that could have been, parts of this could have been the plot to Howard the Duck. I don't know. Again, no proof. It just, uh, it feels like it. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. What do you think? Um, do you remember, did you, have you heard this story before? Would you have been all into a Dazzler movie? Are you looking forward to Dazzler on Disney Plus? What are you thinking about all this? I said the word Dazzler a lot during the last uh, 12 minutes or so. Uh, like, subscribe, follow me on Twitter at Comic Perch, ask questions there, see if you want something, and uh, hang in there. Thanks for listening.